South Hills, I wanna let you in behind the scenes and give you some insight with the budget that we set for 2022. Now, I know many of you are sitting in a campus that's probably been in existence for two years, five years, maybe seven years, but the reality is, is our church has been in existence for 24 years. So we've had a lot of history, a lot of story, a lot of experience with setting church budgets. So in 2022, our budget was set for $4,611,625. Year to date, where we're at today, $2,607,201. So for October, November, and December, we are short $2,004,424. Now, in the past, you've seen me stand here in the month of December and tell you where we're at and what is the gap that we would need to close. And today what I'm doing is I wanna make sure I bring that number to your attention sooner because I know that many people are operating out of fear with what's been happening in our economy, with the inflation, with gas prices going up. And what I wanna do is I wanna make sure that we're putting our trust in God. For the last couple of weeks, you've heard me stand up here and give the 90 day challenge. The 90 day challenge is an opportunity for those that have not taken a step towards trusting God with their finances to move in that direction. Step one, being obedient and trusting God with with a tithe, which is the first tenth of your income. The next step would be going above and beyond and doing an offering above your tithe, which is above and beyond. And then step number three, which was the step I shared with you last week that my family and I are taking, which is increasing our tithe and increasing our above and beyond. When I see the numbers that we're facing right now, I don't look at this as a number problem. I've been in ministry way too long. What I see is an opportunity for God to transform lives, for God to bless lives, my life, your life. And as we step out in faith and trust God and put our faith in God. So South Hills, I just wanted to take a moment today and ask you to take this step to have your life transformed. minutes here to run through this incredible message that I provided for uh, that God has put in my heart to share with you. We are in week three, week three of our Family Month series, a series on how we can uh, have healthy families. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter who you are, where you came from, at the end of the day, we all want healthy families. We do. But having healthy families requires us to put in the work. It requires us to kind of change things around, right, in order to, to kind of move in the direction where we hope that our family will be situated, whether that's tomorrow or next week, next month, next year, or in a few years from now, okay? And so today's message is titled, Be a Family on a Mission. Be a Family on a Mission. Can you remember... A time, for those of you who have kids, or maybe you remember when you were a kid, the times where uh, your kid, uh, you told your kid to do something, and they replied with, but why? But why, right? Now, a child can ask, but why, and infinitely, but why, but why, but why, but why, but why, but why? But, but why, right? And it, 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 as a parent, it will drive you crazy, right? And your reaction is to tell them simply, Man, just because I said so. I'm the man in this house. I run this house. You do it because I told you. Punto. <laughs> For those Spanish-speaking people, that means period, right? Which, which in reality, isn't good for them. It isn't, it isn't good for them, and we find that absolutely annoying. Like, it's not good for them. But honestly, is it, is it good enough for you? When someone tells you, because I told you so? If you get an email at work requiring you to do something different than what you've already been doing, you want to know right, why, right? Like, well, I got to do that. At least you tell yourself, but why? You, know, you may not, <laughs> why do I got to do this again? No, you, you, can't, it's, it's, you start asking why. If something you buy, like gas, suddenly doubles in price, 
You want to know why? You see, we creations, we, we humans are curious creatures. It's not enough to be told what to do. We want to know why. Why do we need to do it? In fact, nothing creates more confusion or anger by being forced to do something that we don't understand the reasoning behind. And so the question of why is a preoccupation with purpose. We don't want our actions to be meaningless. And the harder the thing is to do, the more this is true. We want, we want to know why we need to do this. We want to understand it. If it requires me to change, if it requires me to be uncomfortable, if it requires me to be inconvenienced, to give up something, to pay more money or approach something differently, you better have a really compelling and convincing why. Some of you, when I was just talking about giving tithes and offering, were like, but why? But why? I could sit here and tell you, but why? And the list will be long, but why? But I don't want to offend anyone. Because the fact that you're breathing air is enough to say why, right? Because we want to know. The truth is we want to know where did this idea come from? What is the expectation? What direction is it coming from, right? What motivated this? This is such a big part of who we are that we don't just want to know, right? We just don't want to know this about real life situations, <laughs> but about fictitious characters as well. Have you ever noticed how many movies, shows revolve around the origin of a character? We want to know how a blind attorney came to be a mass vigilante cleaning up the streets of Hell's Kitchen. Anybody? Daredevil. Daredevil. Or when the young Vito Adelini journeys to Ellis Island and has his last name mistakenly changed by an immigration officer to that of his hometown in Italy, Corleone, and becomes the most powerful crime boss in New York City. Our father too. That's where it happens. That's where it happens. That's the origin. Right? Or why Princess Elsa feels the need to isolate herself in the ice castle. Frozen, yes. Right? You see, our culture is obsessed with origin stories because exploring them helps us understand why someone is the way they are or why something works the way it does. That's why we want to know. Have you ever wondered what is the point or purpose behind a family, your family? Is it just to keep everybody alive and a roof over the head and food on the table? Is it just to have your kids get up and kind of do errands for you until they say no mas? <laughs> right? Or do all families have the same purpose or does it vary from family to family? Is there just one right way to do family? Ever wish you could somehow cut to a flashback scene showing the origin story of your family? And I'm not, and I'm not talking about your, how your parents or your grandparents met, Right? That's cool to know that kind of stuff. But I, I want to take it back a little bit further. Like way back, way back. Like a moment that could shed some light on God's intention and purpose in designing the first ever human family. Well, we're going to try to do that this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 1, 26. We're going to start the very beginning. Verse 26 says, then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. I'll read that again. Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. Did you notice something really particular here? Did you notice the pronouns are plural? Like, is that a misprint in the Bible? Or was there a purpose behind it? Why, is it? Why does it say plurals? Why does it say us? And not me or I. You see, the reason is, it's kind of mind-blowing if you ask me, but, but God is not about a singular being. The theological term for this is the Trinity, meaning three in one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In other words, God is a family unto himself. Three unique 
representations of the same interrelated unit. God's intention is to make us like him, right? To make us like him, to identify with and operate inside a series of interdependent connections called family. Family. Let's keep reading verse 27. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Some of you got too good at that part, right? Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea. Sorry, I just came out. That's not even in my notes, right? (laughs) Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. So let's break this down, right? He made them male and female, meaning he made them different. He made them different, and then he gave them the assignment that required them to work together. So he made them different and then gave them the job purpose to work together. See, you cannot be fruitful and multiply by yourself. Doesn't happen, right? Takes two to tango, right? Be fruitful and multiply. This is a team sport here. We've been, we've been talking about, right? We talked about families like a team. This is a team sport. Like a lot of ancient Hebrew poetry, which the scripture is, right? There is more than one meaning an implication to the idea of being fruitful and multiplying. The first is, obviously, have babies. Make more of yourself. Make more of yourself. God is saying, I made you in my image. Now go make more of you in your image. So we get that. That's, that's, that we kind of get that concept. The second is expand the environment, expand the culture and the values that exist there everywhere. So take what I've given you, take that and move it out, spread it out. God's inviting humans to be his co-creators. Think about that. He's inviting us, he's telling us to be part of his team, to be co-creators, to take the components that he made and connect them together in order to make something new. Listen, being fruitful and multiplying isn't copying, it's creating. And God is asking us to create. A child isn't a copy of their parents. They're not a copy of their parents. They are a combination of their parents. They aren't clones. They're new creations. But when you look at a kid, you can see that there is some resemblance of their parents in them. They were made in their image, biologically and behaviorally. That's scary. You look like your parents and you also act like them too. Mm Mm-hmm. But here's the thing, not, not completely because you're not exactly half of each of them. You're a unique combination of both of them. And they are also They are also parts of you that don't look like either one of them. And here's the thing. It wasn't just that God wanted to expand their family. He also wanted them to expand Eden through their family. Everybody know what Eden is, right? The Garden of Eden, where Adam and Eve stepped into the scene where God said, oh, this looks great. I created this world. I created this piece of uh, a territory. And now I'm going to put a man and I'm going to be able to put a woman here. And so he also wanted them to expand Eden, this incredible paradise that he created. God wanted them to recreate their healthy relationships and recreate their healthy environment with the intention that both would reach the ends of the earth. 
Now, I know I probably lost some of you here, but I want to I easily walk, quickly walk you through this. So God said, I want to make people in my image. He gives us Adam and Eve, and he says, be fruitful and multiply. He says, in other words, go have babies, start filling this place up. And he also says, I'm going to put you in this place. I put you in this beautiful place called paradise, called Eden. And I want you to take this incredible place that I've given you, and I want you to take that and everything that's in it and take it out to the world. Follow along? Now, I don't know if you've ever thought about this before, but the Garden of Eden didn't enclose or surround the earth. It wasn't like the, all, all the earth is Eden. No, it was a little section. It was a small space. This garden was a prototype of God's intentions. And his assignment to them was take what I've done here and replicate it everywhere. Yeah, it's going to be a lot of work and you're going to need a lot of help. So get going. Start multiplying, right? Multiply yourselves to get the job done. And now this brings us up to an interesting question. If God wants paradise everywhere, if God wanted paradise everywhere, why didn't he put paradise everywhere? He could have. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He created the Garden of Eden. Why not just make the world the Garden of Eden? Why why, why wouldn't he do that? Because he could have, but he didn't. Why? Because he wanted to incorporate us into the process. He wanted to include us in the process. He wanted us to have skin in the game, right? His strategy to accomplish his vision for the world wasn't to just create an army or a group of factory workers or the toy soldiers. That wasn't his purpose, right? That wasn't his purpose to create cookie cutters of people. When I look at my brother-in-law, we look different. We're chunky, (laughs) but we're different. He's dark skin, I'm lighter skin. He's handsome, I'm not, right? He has a bum leg, I got a, everything doesn't work for me, right? And so he created us differently. He didn't want people to be cookie cutters. His vision for the world wasn't to create this army or group of factory workers, but to create a family. A family. God's done things this way since the very beginning. Let me show you what I'm talking about. He promised to bless all the nations through the family of Abraham. And then he's then through, the, uh, through an even bigger family, through the family of Israel. And then he goes, I'm going to bless the world through, this, uh, through my son Jesus. And then ultimately through the church, the family of God. And so God is on track. He's on track of trying to figure out how to, to get his purpose and his plan all through the earth. And these are just a few of the examples that represent generations of people just to get us where we are now. So much progress has been made. But it's happened one family at a time. Yeah, it's a, it's a whole process. Think about it. You have to find a partner. You got to have children. You got to raise them. You got to disciple them. You got to give them vision. You got to equip them. You got to empower them to focus on, uh, focus on them, an aspect of God's overall vision in a way that leverages them, uh, their unique strengths and abilities. And then you got to release them to go look for their partner so that they can start the process all over again. I had trouble with that last part, releasing them (laughs) to go find a partner. (laughs) So I'm like, "Mm, no, mm, no, that was not it. (laughs) So pray for me. (laughs) Church, the bottom line is that God thinks, he thinks about strategies and solutions differently than the modern Americans do. Think about this. God builds families, not factories. He prioritizes relationships over requirements. His focus is on the quality, not the quickness. And he emphasizes what over how. 
Genesis 1, 28 reminds us that God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and govern it, reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and all the animals that scurry along the ground. When I read that, I immediately think, man, that's a whole lot of what and very little how. A whole lot of what and very little how. And that's because God wants them to have some ownership in the creative process. He wants you to have some skin in the game, right? To take inventory of what they have and brainstorm and dream and experiment from, uh, with how to get from where they are to where he wants them to go. And so God includes us in this incredible system that he calls family. This is consistent with who God is and, and how God does things. I want you to jot this down or take a picture of it. God seems to prefer to lead us through vision and values instead of rules and regulations. God seems to prefer to lead us through vision and values instead of rules and regulations. You know why some of your friends won't want to go to church? Because they're stuck on the rules and regulations. They don't want to come to church because they think church is all about the do's and don'ts, about what, the, what I can do and cannot do. And they're going to continue to believe that until you show them differently, until we show the world differently, that God is more interested in visions and values than he is about rules and regulations. If you've been watching the, the, the baseball playoffs, there's a commercial that I love that shows that talks about these thugs running the streets and saying and being kind of be a thorn in the side of politics and, and rules and regulations. And they're doing things different. And at the end, this is that's what Jesus did. I love that. This is how he prefers to parent us, church. He starts with the why and allows us to be part of crafting the how. This is, when I think about that, that he starts with the, with the why and allows us to be part of how the how is created. And I think about, man, do you run, is that how your family runs? Is that the way your family works today? When we dive into the origin story of family, what we realize is that it's not just about keeping everybody alive and a roof over their head and, or just making sure that they're happy and feel good about themselves. God's vision is way bigger than that church. He wants you to see your family as a team working together to better the world on his behalf. He wants you to work as a unit as one unit and make a lasting impression on this earth. And so if you really believe that, how would you, how would you go about that? How would you do things? How would you run your family different if you understood that and believed that he wants your family to work as a team together in order to change this world? Think about how a team works. Right? A team is put together to play a specific game and accomplish a certain goal. The goal requires them to work collectively right? because they could never achieve what they want to achieve individually. No matter how good they are, no matter how, what their strengths are, you cannot win individually. You have to do it as a team. Think about the Super Bowl, right? The NFL teams, all NFL teams, that's their goal. They want to win a Super Bowl. But they can't win the Super Bowl by themselves, by one, by, by, by one person. Selfish players who don't know how to work within a team because they're hyper-focused on their own individual goals and stats and paydays don't do well long-term because nobody wants to play with them. Nobody wants to be on their team. When a team is struggling and not winning, the coach will often say, let's get back, let's get back to the basics, right? In a way, it's a call to revisit their origin story. It's a way of saying, man, we've gotten sidetracked here. 
Forget about what everyone else is doing. What are we doing? What are we going to do, right? What goals are we after? What strengths do we possess? And what team strategies do we need to implement to move toward the goal that we all got into this from the very beginning? What if you took this same approach in your family, church? How would you even do that? How, how would you even go about that? And I'm going to quickly give you three things on what you can do at home to implement. Three filters of family framework. Number one, purpose, right? We are uh, what we're all ultimately here for and why. Purpose. When you think about an NFL team, the NFL teams have the same goal year after year, year after year. And that is what? To win a Super Bowl. All families have the same goal as well. To be fruitful, multiply, and garden. What do these metaphors mean? To produce good things, to replicate your values, and to cultivate healthy growth. Deuteronomy 6.5 says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your strength. You can start there. Start there. Number two, playbook. How we specifically go about, how we specifically go about it here. An NFL team, right? An NFL team goes about it, uh, different NFL teams go about it differently based on the players and the coaches that they have. For example, if you got a good running back, well, most of your offensive strategy will be around the running game. When it comes to family, different families go about being fruitful and multiplying differently depending on their skills, on their personalities and passions and placement of that family. For example, create a sense of belonging for those who are lacking or make church as inviting as possible for children. Ephesians 2.10 says, we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the good things that he planned for us a long time ago. So what are the specific good things that God has set you aside and your family to do? Well, those are questions that you need to ask. What are those things? Does, does, does your whole family know what those things are once you understand them? Do they understand and agree with them? Maybe you're wondering, how do you even go about figuring this out? What are the skills and the talents and the abilities that God has gifted us? What's the purpose for my family? What has he called us to do? Well, you're going to have to sit down with your family and ask these questions. What excites us? What inspires us? What saddens us? What angers us? What gifts and abilities exist within us? Here's why you need to answer this question. It's super important that we answer these questions because knowing who you're called to be brings clarity to what you ought to do. If you don't know who God created you to be, if you don't understand the gifts and the talents that he's put inside of you, then you don't know where you're going or what you need to do in life. Does that make sense? And lastly, position. How I uniquely contribute to our goal is the con in the context of this family. When it comes to the NFL, players have roles that, have, uh, that help the overall goal of the team. Maybe on this team where the running game is the strategy, you're a wide receiver. And if, you have, and if you're on this type of team and it has a running strategy, most of the plays are not going to run through you. But your position on the team is still very important. It's important for the team to win. You got to play your part. You got to play your role. And when it comes to family, Individual members of the family have different roles that help the overall goal. Maybe someone in your family is the encourager. Maybe someone in your family is the creative one. Maybe there's another person that's highly organized, a.k.a. Monica Pena. <laughs> the question is, how do I use these things for us instead of just me? Colossians 3.17 says, whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Listen, the, we tend to approach the idea of family 
in the wrong order, in the reverse order. When we think about family, we, we start prioritizing our position. Like, what do I want? What am I passionate about? What are my goals? It's I and my all the time. And we really don't think about how we fit in the context of our family because the thought process is, who cares? As long as I'm getting mine, as long as I'm doing what benefits me, that works in my favor, sure, when it comes to God, I'll make my money first. I'll do what I need to do to get my family situated first. And then if, if I have anything left over, then I'll throw God a bone. And that's unfortunate that the world we live in thinks like that. The truth is family and home should get the best of everyone's talents and skills before work, before school, or everything else. I want you to sit on that, right? Think about it as I wrap this up. Family and home should get the best of everyone's talents and skills before work or school or anything else does. I don't know the dynamics of your home, but maybe you've been running it this way. You've been giving everyone else all of your time and energy and you've brought the leftovers home to your spouse, to your kids, to your loved ones. Is this the priority that you want your kids to understand and grasp for their family? Or do you see your family as a team brought together by God to leverage every member's gifts and talents and personalities and even their weaknesses to accomplish God's bigger purpose exactly where he has you today? Does your family have a bigger story your lives are all telling together? Because it shouldn't be that your family is a family of four, five, six, seven, and each one is going in the opposite direction, telling their own story. When we just learned that God created you and your family to tell a bigger story. You see, being a valued part of a team aimed at a specific purpose is built into all of us at such a deep level that if your family doesn't experience that with you, then they're going to find it somewhere else. They're going to go and find it somewhere else. So we need to ask ourselves, church, what's my family most known for? What's my family most known for? Is it God's purposes? Or is it God's purpose or our preferences that's coming to the forefront. This is an interesting bit of homework because it requires to give an answer and it also requires other people to, who know your family to give their honest impression of your family. Maybe you think that your family is known for this but yet your neighbors and the school Families that go where your kids go to school, they think differently about you. That you, you, you hope that you're giving this vibe, but other people think that you're giving off a different vibe. And so is how you want to be known how you're actually known? Are you most known for what God wants you to be known for? Or you said, oh man, the Peñas are going to be known for this. If not, maybe it's time to change some things in your life. To shift some priorities. To alter some schedules. To make some different decisions for you and yours. For your kids 
and your kids' kids and your kids' kids' kids so that legacy can be altered today, starting today. And so to help you through with these ideas in the context of your family, today we giving you a little gift bag here and it has a pencil and it has a pad and it has some potent hand sanitizer. Do not spray it around your face because it will choke you. But even more importantly is this little sheet of paper that's stapled inside there. This is a worksheet that we've put together for you to go home in your family time to, to ask these questions, right? To list the top 10 values, right, for you and the top 10 values for your family to kind of break it down. What are the talents, skills, and abilities of each member in your family and how we can kind of use this information to put it all together to create a family dynamic that will leave an incredible legacy, to leave an incredible impact on this world that we live in today and for the years to come. You see, things don't happen by chance, church. You can't leave here and say, oh, that's going to happen if, you don't, if you're not intentional about it. If you don't do something to change the trajectory of where your family is going. Do you have issues? Yes, every family has issues. But until you address the issues, until you do something different, nothing's going to change. So at South Hills, we are all about doing the practical. We want to put tools in your hand that, that make you say, aha, I get this. I can do this today. I can sit down with my family tonight and we can discuss this and ask these questions and figure out a different trajectory that God has purposed for us because the way we've been doing things recently hasn't worked out for us. So what do I need to do to change it and create this incredible family environment that's filled with purpose and intention and that actually makes an impact for the kingdom. Amen? No, no. Some of you will be like, I don't know, Pastor. I don't know. That amen or that nod was like, I don't know. I don't know if I agree with that. I get it. You know why? Because change is hard. Change is hard. And to have a healthy family is going to require you to work. It's going to require you to work. And work is what's going to change the family dynamics. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we bless you. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you that you are giving us tools and you're giving us wisdom and insight on how we can lead and live a better life full of purpose and intention, how we can take this family unit that you've given us, Lord, Lord, and, 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 and figure out where is it that you want us to go? What is our purpose? What is our meaning in life? And how do we change the world for better? How do we take this, what you have taught us, and share it with the world, Lord Heavenly Father? How do we live the life that you created? us to live, my God. Help us to be intentional. Help us to put in the work. Help us to change the trajectory for our children and our children's children and our children's children's children, Lord Heavenly Father, so that we can leave a lasting legacy, one that is full of hope and full of peace and full of joy and full of life, Lord. One that we can trace it back to today heard this incredible message about family. To you be all the glory and all the honor. In your name we pray. Amen.